thank our sponsors, which are the Worthington and Caron uh, legal firm and uh, Napoli Byrne uh, from New York, as well as Eli Lilly, who gave us a grant in Metamune, um, who makes CTLA for antibody, uh, and also the Faris law firm. They have very generously donated to help sponsor uh, all this, uh, all these activities. So uh, I have to thank uh, Claire. Um, and uh, for organizing a lot of this stuff. And Vicki from the Dean's office at, the, at East LA. I don't know, is Vicki in here or no? She's outside. So anyway, Vicki has done a large, a large, worked a lot about getting this done. So she's been, she's been working this for three years now. So she's done an excellent job. Um, the next talk, unfortunately, is me again. God dang. If anyone wants to talk about palliation, come on up. <laughs> um, actually, I didn't. I, I want to actually talk about this a little bit. Last year, we had uh, one of the local experts for palliative therapy here talking about all the different aspects of palliation, and that's in a very important part of, of this disease because, as everybody's talked about and said, uh, nobody here has yet been able to talk about a cure for, for mesothelioma. So palliation is, is an important aspect to the treatment uh, of patients with this disease. And, and I, and I uh, wanted to talk about some specific kind of thoughts because um, what typically happens, and unfortunately, in, in more than more cases than I'd like to admit to, is that patients who ultimately get seen from our institution and go to another hospital or be seen by other doctors, they literally walk in the door and they see the word mesothelioma and they start getting them ready for hospice care. So unfortunately, a lot of people are, I've actually had to rescue two patients from hospice care because they were inappropriately put in hospice care. And actually, I saw one recently who came in from Michigan. Um, speaking of Michigan, uh, <laughs> who had been in hospice for two years uh, in Michigan, you know, with mesothelioma and not being treated. So it's, it's you know, there's a lot of uh, issues regarding palliation and hospice care that I want to talk about from a surgical standpoint. So I have no conflicts or disclosures regarding palliation and its care. So um, do we have the mantra up here so I can preview? The preview's not up, so I can't even, I can't really see at the angle, the glare. So anyway, cancer therapy, traditionally, when you see people, they get um, listed as being, un giving, giving, receiving curative or palliative therapy. So uh, usually it's, it's one or the other, and, and people think of it in those terms, which I think is a little bit uh, inaccurate. Um, so recently, palliative care has become a very expanded service uh, at the v Veterans Hospital in West LA. Everybody that gets admitted to the ICU basically is they want to have a palliative care consult on, which is to me a little bit odd. Um, but I've had uh, kind of mandatory palliative care consults on patients who have just done a, a curative resection for an early lung cancer and they happen to be in the ICU for other reasons, and, and so it's, it's, it's kind of an odd thing to do, but because the palliative care is becoming such a uh, large and important part of, of cancer care, I wanted to talk about how I view palliative care, which is a little bit different than the traditional views. So there's definitions and expectations that are, are changing of palliative care. Intensive care units are, are um, em employing palliative care in just patients uh, in the hospital in general. Uh, and there's also the issue of hospice care and how that is, intersects with uh, palliative care. So the question is to me is what is curative, uh, what is palliative? You know, even if you have somebody with lung cancer and you take out their lung, early lung cancer, they get a second lung cancer in another five years, so they're not really cured of their risk for lung cancer or their disease really. It's just, it's just that they got one tumor uh, under, you know, under control. So who decides if there's overlap between palliative care and curative care? Uh, if you have something that you can do pretty aggressively like chemotherapy and, it's, and it helps people feel better but it doesn't cure them, is that something that's curative or palliative? 
uh, and the, the, the ever-present thing of being DNR in a hospital, do not resuscitate orders are helpful for nurses to understand what to do in emergencies, but they also come with a lot of connotations in them. And, and uh, oftentimes, at least if you have a mesothelioma patient and you put them in an ICU and you make them DNR, the, the nurse almost never goes in there and to see them anymore because they feel like they shouldn't, didn't need to. So DNR does not mean do not really treat. Um, and so what should palliative care be, uh, and is there also there's a, in the hospice care, there's a time limit of six months, so you're, I'll talk about that in a minute, in, in a minute but basically uh, within six, if you're within six months of theoretically of, of dying, then you should be in hospice, but if you're seven months, you can't be. So you know, the question is what do patients want? What do, what do, you, what do the patients need? Uh, and this is a typical uh, diagram for a cartoon from palliative care publications. You have uh, have this, this, which is supposed to represent all of cancer care, I, I guess. And on this side, where it's white, this is curative therapy. So this is effective therapy. And then when you get beyond that, theoretically going this way, you get in the timeline, you get into supportive care, where you do things actively to help you with symptom man management. But then uh, at some point in six months around that area, prognosis gets pretty worse and then you go into end of life care which means basically I'm not sure what that means but it means that you're supposed to be only doing things to help you with severe symptoms and then then once you die then it's bereavement care so that's the kind of the normal uh, kind of idea that people have for palliative care and this is kind of the peaks of necessary care so when you get your first diagnosis and active treatment you have this really big peak of lots of care going on then you go in this survivorship mode where you you know you're okay you're not, you don't really have tumor and you don't really need care so you don't really have anything done then you get a recurrence and then you get these little blips with the recurrence and eventually it, it gets out of control and you get chronic problems with increasing debility and then your care level goes up uh, so this is kind of the the, the uh, idea idea that's normally um, promulgated. So if you look at kind of the idea of what palliative care is supposed to do, this is standard care and this is percentage of things that were done. This, this is a percent of patients that received aggressive care, uh, percent of the patients that uh, uh, had uh, orders for whether they want to be resuscitated or not, and then and this is the duration of the hospice care. So if you look at standard care, standard oncologic care, basically most people get referred to hospice four days before they die and, and have a little, relatively low level of uh, discussion ahead of time whether they should be DNR or not and, and have pretty aggressive care half the time, which probably is not appropriate. So if you, you put in palliative care into the middle of this, you can you know, um, significantly reduce the amount of potentially inappropriate aggressive care. You increase the number of talks ahead of time about what needs to happen in terms of DNR and all that kind of stuff, and you, and you prolong the actually successful palliative care period of, of uh, symptom management and hospice care, theoretically. That's the, that's the thought. So when you look at this, this is uh, from CMS website. So if you, if you want to figure out what you need uh, for hospice requirements, this is hospice requirements. In order to be eligible to be under hospice care for Medicare, an individual must be entitled to Part A. That's one thing. And certified as being terminally ill by a physician and having a prognosis of six months or less uh, if, the, if the disease runs its normal course. So this six-month thing is a cutoff. And if you're not there, you, they don't want you to be having or they don't want to pay for palliative care, theoretically, hospice care, and if you're within the six months, they will, uh, and each, after six months, you wonder what happens if you're in six, for over six months, well, then you have to be recertified that you're still in need, needing hospice care, so it can be prolonged for 12 or 18 months. So the important thing is that hospice uh, care in the program is supported for people who are terminally, terminally ill, basically, and whatever that means. So that, that's an important idea. Um, so these are some facts about hospice care. I know you can't probably read them too much, but it's supposed to help patients live comfortably. Uh, it's supposed to focus on comfort, uh, and it's supposed to be uh, given by a, a you know extremely uh, specialized, trained group of individuals that are specializing in this particular area, uh, and that uh, hospice is isn't only for patients with cancer either. So that's an important thing. So this is just basically uh, streamlining end of life care, making it appropriate. So the disease indications for hospice are cancer, but there's also COPD, which we deal with. C 
HF, uh, infections like HIV and AIDS, and um, Alzheimer's as well, severe dementia and strokes uh, with obviously severe impairment. So all these diseases can be uh, put on hospice care as well. Um, so there are other hospice facts. There are non-covered care. So non-covered care, if you're in hospice, is that you can't be treated with intent to cure your illness. Now the question is what, is, what do they mean by intent to cure your illness? So is chemotherapy, if you get it, if you get it, and is that really an intent to cure you or, or palliate you? So it becomes very cloudy about where, where you divide the line. And uh, prescription drugs, for instance, that are meant to cure your illness um, rather than just control pain or other things are not allowed. So depending on who is taking care of you, the, the, the uh, number of drugs that are available for this may be completely different. Um, now let's explain in a second how this comes up, and particularly in our care. Um, so also, if you're on a hospice team, you can't get care from anybody else because only the hospice team can determine whether you need that care. So if it's from somebody else, uh, not provided by the hospice medical team, then you won't do it. Room and board, they won't do. Uh, and also emergency rooms, uh, if it's related to your the reason why you're in hospice, they won't pay for it because you're not supposed to go to the emergency room. Um, but even if it's even if it would be good palliation to do so, if it's for another reason, like you got gallbladder trouble, then then you can go and they'll pay for it. So it's it's, it's kind of an odd thing. So the question is, when do you start palliative care on patients with mesothelioma? Because our patients are never really, at least in my mind, treated for a cure. We treat them to control the tumor for as long as possible. So in life, it's hard to say. But you know, in my view, palliative care starts when you're this old. Everybody's dying from from the day you're born. So you know, palliative care can be changing your diaper. So you know, when when how do you recognize it? You know, when somebody's happy and they've had their diaper changed and they have good palliation. So. <laughs> Um, so, I, I, uh, <laughs> so the question is, what's not in palliative care? So is surgery not in palliative care? Because it's certainly, uh, I think a lot of patients, and, and Joe would probably agree with me, that a lot of patients are well palliated by, by surgery, and, and chemotherapy can palliate a lot of patients in terms of symptoms. Radiation does a lot of palliation. So what are the treatments exactly they're talking about that are meant for curative treatment in mesothelioma that, that would be um, obviated and not, not possible for patients in, in hospice care? One of them I want to talk about is interventional procedures. So we do a lot of cryoblations, and those aren't curative procedures, um, but they are procedures directly treating a particular area. And if it's a painful area in particular and it gets rid of the pain, it's good palliation. But these things are typically not uh, allowed during hospice time. So there is data, this is some data looking at lung cancer, looking at several different chemotherapy regimens and looking at symptom management and showing that there's better symptom control and, and even survival in many cases uh, if you give patients chemotherapy. So chemotherapy can certainly be given in a palliative fashion. And here's symptom control, uh, again with chemotherapy, looking at different, different agents and uh, again in lung cancer. And you see the percent improved, there, there's really reasonable um, numbers of patients that can be improved by treating with things that are typically or may be thought of in certain circumstances of being curative but are really palliative. So patients with mesothelioma can have any, a lot of different symptoms, but they can have pain. That's one of the biggest ones. Shortness of breath is one of the ones people are getting very concerned about because if you can't breathe, it's very, it's very uh, anxiety producing. Fatigue is one of them, as in everybody. Problem swallowing is very frequent. Loss of appetite and depression. Uh, all these things uh, can be palliated with specific drugs and in certain circumstances, um, certain procedures. Problem is that all, also even remember is palliative care results in, in, in in, uh, symptoms. So you get constipation, hypersomnolence, confusion, nausea, vomiting from drugs, insomnia, and changes in sexual function. So uh, palliation itself can create a lot of a lot of symptoms. So you, you have to really, I think, be a little bit um, reasonable in terms of what you're considering. So this is something that we do very often. This is again that same slide showing that we can ablate lesions and, and make uh, patients' pain actually much better, much uh, easier to control. And even if there 
are five other lesions here that are asymptomatic. If this one's symptomatic, we try to ablate it in order to control pain a lot better than putting somebody on a lot of narcotics and having them sleep through the day. So this is something that's very good at palliation, and yet when we try to get insurance companies to pay for this, even if somebody's not in hospice, they, re they oftentimes refuse to pay for this. They don't think it's a valid treatment, uh, when in reality it's probably one of the better treatments that we can do. So, you know, sometimes surgery is the best thing to do, and sometimes sometimes uh, these kind of procedures to do. So surgery can remove a lot of tumor and allow somebody to, to live a lot better without pressure on their lung and have less shortness of breath. And yet, people don't think surgery is really a palliative procedure very often. So one of the things that uh, I wanted to bring up is basically that palliative care, people talk about a lot of things, pain control and all that kind of stuff. But in reality, um, when you look at a lot of things, they all can be used in a paleo fashion. So paleo care can be um, not the end of life care, but it's not no care. So patients should not be just dropped or, or uh, uh, no longer followed because they're in uh, end of life care or palliative care in any way. I think palliative care starts with the diagnosis at least with mesothelium, if not before. Um, and so once we start taking care of patients, we should do all the things we can possibly do to take care of their symptoms and make them uh, more uh, living better lives and more comfortable. So it starts from the moment the medical provider gets, begins taking care of the patient. Uh, physicians, nurses, everybody needs to be less focused on the DNR, DNI, comfort care, all those kinds of buzzwords and, and actually more, more tuned in to the actual personalized palliation of each patient. And again, these are my collaborators and, and I want to thank everybody for, again for coming today. Uh, and we can take questions again at the end, questions and comments. Thank <laughs> you.